I am Rafael Martin, Vice President and Chief of Staff here at UT Dallas. It is my pleasure to welcome you here to this latest uh, joint event between the University of Texas at Dallas and UT Southwestern on COVID-19 vaccines and, uh, and uh, the kickoff of our Vax UTD campaign. Before we get underway with the presentation, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the president of UT Dallas, Dr. Richard Benson, who will have a brief statement before we uh, commence with our program. Dr. Benson. Well, thank you, Raphael, and good afternoon, all. It is a pleasure to greet you via this virtual format to a timely presentation on matters related to containing the COVID-19 virus. The staggering effect of the global pandemic has changed much in the way that we operate at UT Dallas. Through our Comets United plan, we have taken care of each other while keeping our focus on the core mission of our university, which is to teach, conduct research, and provide service to the external community. Comets United has been a campus-wide effort led by Dr. Martin. I want to thank him and all who have worked in par partnership with Dr. Martin for their tremendous work. I'm extraordinarily proud of the way in which we have responded as a university. Over the last year, we have provided information and resources to our students, faculty, and staff that has lessened the disruptions. One of our most recent efforts was to serve as a site for vaccinations, a collaboration with the UT Southwestern Medical Center. From its opening in March through its closing in early July, 49,000 plus doses were administered. More than 1,000 individuals from the UT Dallas community volunteered at the site. The vaccine is protecting people from severe Ill illness and lowering hospitalizations, and that is very good news. And because of that, it is possible for UT Dallas to return to pre-pandemic operations. Since some of you may, be not, may not be familiar with UT Dallas, let me tell you a little bit more about our university. Our almost 30,000 students learn in exceptional classrooms and laboratories in modern buildings that are set in a beautifully landscaped campus. Students interact with stellar faculty and outstanding staff in a manner that expands and develops their full potential. UT Dallas is classified as a Carnegie R1 doctoral institution, one of only 131 in the nation. Our federal research funding is keeping us competitive with the very best universities. And Forbes has recently ranked us as the number one best value public university in Texas, based on the quality of our education and the financial outcomes for our students. We offer degrees in some of the most in-demand fields with a heavy emphasis on science, technology, engineering, management, and mathematics. And our planned arts complex, the Athenaeum, will be a resource for academic research and cultural engagement. We are expanding our footprint in the Dallas Medical District and will soon break ground for a new building that will house joint biomedical engineering research with UT Southwestern. And we have embarked on a partnership with the city of Richardson's Innovation Quarter that will encourage startups and entrepreneurs in our area. And I hope from this listing, you can see how important it is for us to have a robust engagement with students in the classroom, with researchers in our laboratories, and with colleagues in the broader community. All of these vital activities are diminished when close personal contact carries a mortal threat to ourselves, our family, and our friends. Thus, it is essential that we pursue every available means to thwart this terrible pandemic, starting with a vaccine. And accordingly, this is the topic of today's presentation. So thank you for participating. Thank you for all you have done to help UT Dallas navigate the pandemic. And thank you for all you will continue to do as UT Dallas transitions back to high levels of personal engagement. And so now I'm happy to turn the program back over to Dr. Martini. Thank you, Dr. Benson. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our, to welcome once again uh, to UT Dallas, Dr. Ruben Arasaratnam. Uh, Dr. Arasaratnam graduated from the University of Oxford Medical School and completed his internal medicine residency in England, uh, achieving membership in the Royal, uh, Royal College of Physicians in 2010. He subsequently moved to the United States uh, to pursue an internal me medicine residency at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and an infectious disease fellowship at the Baylor College of Medicine uh, under the American Board of Internal Medicine Research Pathways Program. During his fellowship, he gained uh, additional clinical training in transplant infectious diseases and pursued translational research in T-cell immunotherapy for the treatment of viral infections in immunocompromised recipients. 
Uh, Dr. Aris Rotnam joined the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in 2017, where he primarily focuses on clinical and research efforts in the care of immunocompromised patients. Welcome, Dr. Aris Rotnam. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much uh, for that um, introduction. Um, Dr. Martin, and thank you for um, uh, Dr. Benson for highlighting where we are and the important issues of vaccination in this pandemic. Um, it's it's a real pleasure to be back at UT Dallas. It really is. I've, um, I've managed to give a, a couple of speaking engagements here, and I love this community. And um, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, have me back. Well, we're going to cover a lot of things today about the vaccine and hopefully answer a lot of your uh, major questions. Um, but one of the key messages that we have here is that, um, you know, I've been giving talks on vaccines for over a year now. And when it started, we were in a development phase of COVID-19 vaccination. We didn't have one that had received emergency use authorization. And we're in a very, very different place now. Uh, but I really want to emphasize that, yes, we're in a much better place, but things are not over and we still have a lot of work to do. And these are the topics that we're going to cover today. So let's talk about how we're doing with um, vaccination and um, our rates of COVID in Texas and in Dallas. So what we can do is actually track uh, week by week numbers of cases that we're getting and the hospitalization rates as well. And the concerning thing is that we are seeing a rise in uh, case numbers and we can do this rolling seven day average as we pick the cases. And so one of the things I want to emphasize is, yes, things are in a much better place than we were a year ago, much better place than we were six months ago. But we're not out of this pandemic. We still have a lot of work to do. And we got to a good place because of masking, distancing and vaccination. And we are in a good place because we have a number of safe and effective vaccines. And yet the uptake of these vaccines is still not what it needs to be. So we have made significant progress with this map showing uh, vaccinations in the US with the um, darker green um, representing a greater percentage of residents vaccinated. And yes, we've made progress, but there's still a long, long way to go. And that's important because of where we are in Texas and where the pandemic uh, may be heading. So unfortunately, and I say this, unfortunately, Texas ranks 40th in the US for vaccinations. And alongside that, we are seeing the rate of positivity of tests increasing to 10% for the first time since February. Right, so I hope you're sort of understanding this, this, this correlation. Yes, vaccination has gotten us to a great place, but if we want to be exiting this pandemic, we need to still push for vaccination. We need to protect ourselves. We need to protect our families. We need to protect our communities. Now, one of the things that's um, done at um, UT Southwestern is you can do uh, modeling, modeling and actually try and predict what might happen in the next couple of weeks and months uh, by um, looking at those who've been hospitalized, looking at the number of cases. And so what you see here is um, the um, estimated number of hospitalizations in the blue line in, in, in July. Um, and that's sort of based upon the fact that um, uh, hospitalizations have increased, COVID-19 cases um, have increased as well. But there is an opportunity to impact that forecast, right? And it really depends on how we behave and how we vaccinate. And so if you look at these um, graphs here, the red line looking at the number of occupied beds with COVID-19 is a forecast. If we just go to a completely unmitigated sort of pre-pandemic patterns and the um, orange line and blue lines are if we have um, more uh, restricted behavior and, uh, and and really also impacting with related to vaccination. And so the message here is that things can 
change pretty rapidly. But the good news is, is we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Um, you know, a year ago, we were down to distancing and masking. Now we have vaccinations. And that is an incredible, incredible tool in both curbing and exiting this pandemic. Now, I think with vaccination and, and with the rise in COVID cases and the spread, many of you would have heard about variants and, and the Delta variants. And the question is, is well, what impact will that have uh, both on our local community in our state and you know, across the nation? So this table shows um, the list of variants. They've now been given um, Greek alphabet um, letters to sort of uh, to by which they're referred to. And I, I want to just say something about variants, because I think what we sometimes get from the media is this idea of like all of a sudden there's this new variant emerging and, you know, this is going to cause problems. I, I, I want to sort of iterate that from the very, very beginning of the pandemic, 2020, we've actually had variants. It's part of the natural viral evolution that it changes. The vast majority of those variants actually don't have any impact on spread, how sick you get, on vaccines. Um, but what we've actually had is, you know, really in the last six months, a couple of variants develop that have been what we call variants of concern or VOC. In the middle of this table, you will be familiar with the Delta variant that is now sort of becoming the most common variant in the uh, United States. And um, studies done, um, fairly sophisticated studies, have shown that this variant is uh, more uh, transmissible, uh, as in easier to spread, uh, you know, from person to person than variants that we've seen before. Um, and there's a possibility of um, increased um, severity of disease. Now, the one thing we're going to talk about is that this should not dissuade you from getting a vaccine because actually there's a large amount of studies showing and even just one published recently in just the New England Journal of Medicine showing that if you complete that full dose vaccination schedule, that actually there is really minimal impact we're seeing in the community of this variant and breaking through vaccines. So the message would be is if you're you know, concerned about the Delta variant, you sh that should not dissuade you from getting vaccinated. They actually should persuade you from getting vaccinated because actually that is going to be the best tool for protecting us from this Delta variant. Now, um, the US is actively uh, monitoring through the CDC these emerging um, variants. And so this is not just going to be a story that we have for today. It's going to be a variant monitoring for the next several months. And one thing I just want to iterate is how do variants occur? Well, every time a virus spreads, every time a virus has a chance to replicate, there is going to be in the natural process, a risk of a variant developing. And so every opportunity that we have to stop viral replication, whether it be vaccination, um, behaviors with distancing and masking, each time we stop viral replication, each time we stop person to person spread, we have dramatically reduced the chances of new variants occurring. And so if you're sick of variants and hearing about it, the answer is vaccination. Now, you um, may have heard, you, you know, you may have heard about this, this entity of breakthrough cases. You may have even had friends or, or family members who say, well, you know, I know someone who got the vaccine, but then they actually got COVID. So, you know, does, does, it, does it work? Well, firstly, it's very important to sort of understand that these vaccines are superbly effective and there are different categories of effectiveness. And you'll hear numbers that are bantered about between different vaccines and effectiveness. Oh, this one's 66%, this one's 95%. But let me tell you something, and we'll come on to it later, that all of these vaccines have a near 100% protectiveness against you being hospitalized or dying from COVID-19. And that is incredible for a vaccination. Now, no vaccine is 100% effective. There will sometimes be breakthrough cases. My strong suspicion 
is that a lot of um, those cases may have occurred in the setting where uh, someone actually might have had an infection but didn't know about it, asymptomatic, at the time of getting vaccinated. Because remember, it takes two weeks after your last dose, whether it's the second dose for the mRNA vaccines or the first, the single dose for the J&J &J vaccine, two weeks after that dose is when you actually get full immunity. But regardless, if uh, people do get infections, what we're seeing is that they generally tend to be uh, very low symptomatic and they don't get hospitalized. And so that is a very encouraging thing. Vaccines prevent COVID-19 and even in the very, very rare chance that you do get COVID-19, it actually limits it to a very mild illness and not a hospitalization. So there are stats listed here about breakthrough COVID-19 cases, but let me just highlight what's in red. As I talk to physicians, both within Dallas and across country, as I hear about people getting admitted still with COVID-19, the number one thing that is resonating across the medical community is that these people are not vaccinated. So when we think about breakthrough COVID-19, the bigger question is this infection, the Delta variant, people who are getting hospitalized, hospitalization, it's going to fall upon people who are not protected, who are not vaccinated. Now let's talk a little bit about safety of um, COVID-19 um, vaccines because we're fortunate, as I said, I've been doing this for now over a year. And what's striking to me is, um, um, you know, now in this time period when we've had millions and millions and millions of doses administered and really almost over a year of observation since um, uh, people were enrolled in trials that we really have a huge amount of emerging safety data to reassure the public. And so these vaccines are effective and safe. And as I've mentioned before, um, think about your efficacy and protection, not just about you know, whether you get COVID-19, which these vaccines are absolutely amazing at doing, but actually preventing you from getting hosp hospitalization and death. And we are fortunate, we are very, very fortunate. And I, I always make a point about doing this in presentations. We have the luxury of a number of vaccines that have been approved. And there are several countries around the world, and remember COVID-19 is a global problem, where uh, families and public do not even have access to a single vaccine. It is very, very sad. And so I wanna to iterate to the community today that we are actually in a place of luxury with having these vaccines. And guess what? We actually may have more on the horizon because, you know, it's quite possible that within the next, um, uh, you know, within the, the rest of this year, there is another um, vaccine that's coming that's shown very, very, very good um, uh, data from the phase three trials. This is um, a, a protein based vaccine, very similar to the shingles vaccine, very uh, slightly similar design. And again, it's showing great um, uh, efficacy in the phase three trials for the prevention of COVID-19. And so again, we are fortunate um, that we will um, have a number of vaccines uh, for, uh, for our community. Now, there are different approaches to these um, vaccines. And I think what people have often struggled with is, is that these vaccines that have come out, the mRNA uh, vaccines such as Pfizer, Moderna, or the viral vector vaccines such as J&J, &J, are not typically formats that we have seen before. And what I want to iterate is that all of these um, vaccine formats uh, um, listed here they, they really have the same principle. And that is to say, what are vaccines? Vaccines are what I call teachers of the immune system. They're teachers of the immune system. And you're teaching your body to recognize part of the viral coat or the virus itself so that you will prepare your body with antibodies and other immune cells such as T cells so that when the infection comes, you are ready to fight that infection. And these different formats of vaccines just have different ways of teaching the immune system. And so particularly what you're doing 
with a RNA vaccine or with a viral vector vaccine is you're actually just providing the raw ingredients like a cook and a cookbook and instructions for your own body to actually make a protein, which is the spike protein, which we know is a very, very key part of the virus so that your body will then produce antibodies to that spike protein. This does not mess with your genes. The RNA is rapidly degraded and all you're left with after getting the vaccination is just the antibodies itself. So you cannot get COVID-19 from these vaccines. You will not get a false positive test for COVID-19 if you get these vaccines. All it's doing is providing instructions for your body to make the antibodies and then those instructions are just shredded away. Understandably, a lot of people are concerned about the pace at which these um, vaccines were developed. And it's important to understand, again, because I, I think this has not been conveyed appropriately in the, in the media and, and just in explanation, how were these trials accelerated? Because typically what you will do is you start off with what we call preclinical testing. It's where you test your vaccines in animal models, small scale trials in um, healthy um, human volunteers to check that the vaccine makes an immune response. That's the phase one. Broaden it out to phase two. And then you're asked to test, which is really, does the vaccine prevent clinical COVID-19 infection? Large scale trials in phase three of 30,000 people, exactly the standard that was for other previous vaccines that have been approved. Now, typically what you would do is because vaccines are, the business is kind of pretty costly. Like if you, you wanna be careful with your investments. So typically what you have is very large pauses between these phases. And so it can take a long time. And then you won't really wait to manufacture until you've got that final approval. That's the traditional development process. That could take many, many years. But in the pandemic, we had several advantages. We actually knew a lot about mRNA vaccines because it's been 30 years developing this technology. We actually learned from what I call the brother and sister of SARS-CoV-2 from uh, uh, MERS and SARS-CoV-1. We actually learned how to make vaccines against them and they're actually fairly similar in some respects. Um, uh, but the biggest thing is we sort of poured a lot of money, both private and government entities. We actually poured money into the vaccine development process. And we said, hey, you know what? We need to get a vaccine that's safe and effective. And we will not spare any cost as a global community. We would rather waste billions and billions of dollars in failed vaccine and vials than risk billions of lives lost in this pandemic. And so the risk was not in the integrity of the science, the risk was not in the volunteers in the trial, the risk was the manufacturing. It was in bricks and mortar, it was in vials, it was in dollars. That's where the risk was poured in. It was a big, big financial risk. What does that allow you to do? Well, what it allows you to do is take a process that would be many years and actually streamline it and have overlapping phases, manufacturing in parallel, make those vials even before you know the vaccine is gonna work. And that meant in December, when we actually had those COVID-19 vaccines, we were ready to get them out. And the number of lives that saved with this approach is stunning. You know, we could have been waiting under traditional paradigms months and months and months before vaccine was manufactured, but the approach taken was a financial risk to save lives. As I mentioned before, these, you know, mRNA vaccines, we actually have prior experience in this. So this isn't totally new. And the reason that some of these other viruses, vaccines, you know, haven't made it to the forefront is really that the impetus and the need to sort of prevent diseases like this is sort of far, far less than when we have a pandemic with SARS-CoV-2. The other thing to mention about these trials and how they were conducted is that there is a very high emphasis, rightly so, to say this is not just going to be a vaccine for a particular group of the American population. This has to be for a vaccine for all. Age, gender, 
race, ethnicity, medical conditions. We want that represented in the clinical trials. The FDA specifically requested it from this. So it's a very unique ask in vaccine manufacturing. But what it meant is that these trials were conducted in a way to represent all of our population. So we're very, very lucky. Um, these top three vaccines listed in bold are the ones that have received emergency use um, authorization. But I want to, and, and the Novavax coming and, and, and studies from another vaccine, the AstraZeneca, I want to iterate the idea, the protection from hospitalized COVID-19, protection from severe COVID-19 is really near 100% for all of these vaccines. Now, what are the side effects of this and how does it compare? Well, this is a nice side-by-side um, -side comparison of um, the Moderna Pfizer vaccine and the J&J &J with some of the other vaccines that are commonly administered to our population and that are approved. And what you will actually see is that some of the common side effects here, pain, redness, swelling, they're actually very comparable to um, uh, you know, vaccines that are already approved. And in fact, in some cases, such as the Shingrix vaccine, the reactogenicity or the, the symptoms or side effects that you get is actually a little bit more than what we see with the COVID-19 vaccines. So let's move on and talk a little bit about special um, populations. And I really want to iterate a couple of things here. Firstly, uh, a big um, uh, question often asked is, well, I had COVID, do I need to get the the vaccine and the answer is that you are re it's recommended to still get the vaccine even if you've had COVID-19. For some people when they got COVID-19 it was a very mild infection we don't know if they actually produced the right amount of antibody to protect them but what we do know from the phase three clinical trials is that the vaccines do protect you from infection and so it is rec recommended that you still get vaccinated even if you've had COVID-19 before. I do acknowledge we are seeing some incredibly rare side effects that people might be worried about. Myocarditis in young men, um, the um, cerebral venous uh, sinus thrombus that led to a pause with the J&J &J vaccine. And there's also reports of Guillain-Barre syndrome. I want to iterate though that two things. Uh, why are we detecting these things? We're detecting these things because we have had intense safety surveillance after the vaccine was distributed. Be reminded, this isn't just a case of the vaccine passed the phase three trials, emergency use authorization, off you go, everyone get vaccinated and we'll see what happens. No, as each vaccine gets administered, as each vaccine gets rolled out, there is intense safety monitoring coming through hospital systems, healthcare systems, reporting to feed back and to make sure we pick up any potentially rare side effects. And what these side effects are, these are sort of one in a million side effects or three, one to three in a million. And um, so we're picking these up because of the intense scrutiny and surveillance that is going on. And actually that should be reassuring to the public that we are being very closely monitored for potential side effects. And I really wanna iterate how rare these are. These are very, very rare side effects. And COVID-19 is a real infection and it can lead to hospitalization and it can lead to death. And so that has to be balanced with the detection of these rare side effects. So the one case where you might want to wait after um, where it's recommended to wait after getting infection uh, to get your vaccine is if you have had something called monoclonal antibody therapy. It's recommended you wait three months. The reason is, is that that monoclonal antibody therapy that you use can sometimes interfere with your body producing a response to the vaccine. But other than that, if you've had um, COVID-19 before, you didn't receive monoclonal antibody, you can still get vaccinated as soon as you're feeling better. Now, um, there were populations you couldn't uh, sort of uh, evaluate the vaccine in the phase three trials, and one of those were um, pregnant uh, women. But um, really just published in uh, April in the New England Journal of Medicine, a very um, large report of over 30,000 uh, pregnant women vaccinated with mRNA vaccines and absolutely no safety concerns identified. Um, there are studies showing that pregnant women who end up, you know, hospitalized with COVID-19 
you know, are at higher risk of getting in the ICU and getting sick from COVID-19. And so this is a special population that we do need to um, pr protect. And so a number of the ob societies have, have come out in support of vaccination. Now with immunocompromised patients, maybe you're, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, an organ transplant, or you have friends or family that have organ or bone marrow transplant, or you're on immunosuppressive medication, you are still eligible and it is still recommended that you get the vaccine. Again, there have been societies that have come out with special guidelines to support the vaccine. One thing to note is that your response may be a little bit less. And so when I counsel patients, they have to be a little bit more cautious with the masking and distancing. And, and I want to iterate something because this is important. You live in a community, an educational community. You may have colleagues, you may have students that are immunocompromised and their response to the vaccine may not be as good as yours. And so I want to iterate that by you getting vaccinated, um, you are protecting them. That is a huge thing that you can do. I advise all of my immunocompromised patients to make sure that their family members, friends and community around them, you know, if unless there's a, any um, issue, really do get vaccinated because it protects, it creates a bubble around immunocompromised patients. Now, um, just a reminder that with allergies, um, you may have a drug allergy like penicillin, you may be allergic to eggs, you may be, um, you know, have seasonal allergies. These are, you can still get the vaccine. These are not contraindications for the vaccine. And the only contraindication is if you've had a, a severe reaction to COVID-19 or one of its components. But please remember other routine allergies, drug allergies, um, you know, pet allergies, egg allergies, you can still get the vaccine. This slide just shows you that thing I mentioned earlier the huge safety surveillance that's going on to make sure that we track very, very, very rare side effects or things that might happen as millions and millions of people get vaccinated. And one thing you can do is um, there is a um, app called vSafe. I, I had it after I got vaccinated um, in December. And what it actually does is it, um, it's completely voluntary. Um, and uh, what it does is it just sends you reminders to check in. How are you feeling after one week after your vaccination? How are you feeling after two weeks? How are you feeling after a month? It reminds you about the second dose. And one of the things it does do is it, it can, if you are having, you know, uh, for in the rare instances, you're actually having a side effect um, that is concerning, it can actually prompt a phone call to get more information. I really recommend um, if you're gonna get vaccinated to actually use this VSafe app, I found it great. So, and just a reminder that, um, you know, um, the mRNA vaccines are, are, are two doses. Um, it's important to get that second dose. Um, uh, you know, you get immunity after two weeks after that second dose. And so that's when you're sort of fully protected. And the J&J &J is one dose. Thankfully, as more studies have come, we've managed to bring down the age of um, uh, people eligible for the vaccine. Um, you know, so now it's down to 12. And we're hoping in the next couple of months we'll get data so we can actually go um, lower than that. I know many of us may have children under 12. We're, we're, I do. I'm, I'm really looking forward to when there's a time when you know my children can get vaccinated once the data comes through. Okay, so I just do want to emphasize this. And I there's two dose, completing the two doses for the mRNA vaccines or the one dose for J and J. Important study coming out came out of the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday from England, really showing, especially with the Delta variant rising, pretty much a minimal hit of the Delta variant on vaccinations, especially if you get your two doses. That's why it's really, really, really important to get your doses as the vaccine was studied. And vaccines are the passport to normalcy. We are all sort of wanting to get back to that sense of, of being able to interact in a normal way. And it's going to take a group effort and it's going to take vaccination as a group effort. Um, this CDC table uh, was very nice. Uh, you know, it came out actually a couple of months after I got vaccinated. But once we got the studies showing how vaccines not only protected yourself, 
but actually protected others around you. And and look at the green on the right, you know, really the ability to do those things that we've been longing to do. Vaccination is our way to do that. I'm going to run through a number of um, websites and resources that might be helpful from UT Southwest and many of them actually were written um, by my close colleagues in infectious disease and, and, and they're absolutely wonderful. Um, we have a couple of ones related to you know modeling, uh, forecasting, um, uh, COVID-19 infection and, 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 and uh, very general topics related to um, how that affects you, what kind of symptoms you might have. We have a number of great blogs um, about um, variants and, and uh, vaccines, including uh, dedicated um, blogs written by some of our ob specialists on uh, pregnant pregnant moms. Um, and then um, we have a lot written. Uh, these are from uh, uh, from uh, the top two from my colleagues in the infectious disease um, division. Um, very helpful, uh, short uh, videos about how vaccination um, impacts us. So let's talk a little bit um, about um, what's termed COVID long haul. The CDC has classified COVID-19 infections into acute and then this group of what they call um, you know, post-COVID-19 conditions. It's given a lot of different names, long COVID, chronic COVID. Um, um, and so, you know, this as the pandemic goes on and on and on and more people get infected, we actually study uh, people and sort of see what kind of symptoms go on and how, how long this happens. And this little sort of schematic represents that um, people who have got COVID-19 actually can have a lot of symptoms affecting multiple organ systems that actually persist for a long, long time. And really the broad definition of, of um, long haul COVID, if we're gonna use that term is, is to say, that these are just, um, you know, we really do expect vast majority of people to get better, you know, within several weeks, uh, within four weeks of their infection. But actually there are a percentage that actually developing these long symptoms. And as I mentioned before, it can affect multiple different organs um, uh, and um, it can last for varying lengths of time. And it's not always correlated with how bad your infection was in the first place. Now, there are some sort of more severe manifestations, um, including autoimmune conditions. So, so flares of pre where your you know, body's attacking your own immune system. Some people have these conditions pre COVID, such as, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis. Sometimes that can be exacerbated. And then there's a phenomenon, what we call MIS or multi inflammatory, uh, multi system inflammatory syndrome. Um, typically, it's been noted in the pediatric population, but is also um, present in adults. UT Southwestern is very fortunate. There isn't a magic cure for, you know, uh, people with persistent symptoms of COVID-19. I want to iterate that um, the best way to focus is not on the back end, but actually on the front end and actually getting vaccinated and preventing this in the first place. But we are fortunate to have a wide multidisciplinary um, team of experts um, that are helping people sort of recover um, from uh, uh, COVID-19 with persistent symptoms. So as I iterated, it'd be much better to not have COVID in the first place. And, and vaccinations, we have great safe and effective vaccinations. And so if you, you know, this is the way to prevent long haul COVID. So we have so many tools if you know if you're if you're not vaccinated you need to really be safe with other means but as i iterated before the way to normalcy the way to interaction the way to being able to meet with family and friends safely is is vaccination and so i want to um, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for this opportunity to speak and I hope I've managed to cover a lot of questions and, and be delighted to actually um, uh, to take more questions. Thank you, Dr. Arasaratnam. As usual, just a, a, a torrent of extremely uh, informative uh, facts and, and uh, really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. 
Um, and we do have uh, several questions, uh, both posed kind of before the uh, before the start of this event and, and from attendees. Um, I want to start just by saying there, there are several questions that have been posed uh, by attendees about the university's response uh, to COVID and, and what our plans are going forward. Um, and I'm going to say I, I'm not going to to uh, to address those here. We will be having an event next Wednesday at noon, a town hall specifically to address those questions. So uh, I'm not avoiding those questions. Uh, I'm just not going to take the time with Dr. Aris Rotnam at this point uh, to respond to them. So I would encourage all members of our community to tune into the town hall meeting we'll have next Wednesday um, uh, to address those. Um, so let me start off um, and ask you maybe to um, to reiterate a couple of uh, points uh, in in this context, um, you, you talked about the the safety and e efficacy of uh, the COVID nineteen vaccines. How do they compare to uh, many of the common vaccines that that we see? You know, uh, childhood vaccines, the MMRs. Um, I recently uh, got a, a shingles vaccine. How did the side effects and the efficacy of the COVID nineteen effects compare to those uh, more commonly known vaccines? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think probably the best way to look at it is, is, is how does it compare with viruses that kind of cause similar respiratory illness? So, you know, the flu vaccine um, effectiveness is, is probably around about, you know, between 40 and 60 percent in the natural population. And, you know, when before the vaccines, as the vaccines were developing and before they were even received emergency use authorization, the FDA did a very specific thing and said, hey, we want our minimum benchmark for efficacy to be 50%. And I think many people forget that actually that was the target, 50%. Um, we were incredibly fortunate and really a testament to the decades of scientific work and understanding of this virus to come out in December with um, two mRNA vaccines that hit over 90%. It is absolutely astonishing. Um, and really want to iterate the idea that, you know, yes, you know, these are, in, when you're heading into the 90s, this is, um, and, and really preventing death and hospitalization, this is um, phenomenal. Um, you know, we do see some vaccines that are superbly effective, you know, shingles is, is really up in the 90s, but for a respiratory virus vaccine to do this, um, it is, is incredible. I will also add that as we get more information on the Delta variant, as we study the body's immune response of these vaccines, what's interesting is, is that you know these vaccines are able to generate such a broad immune response that they really do take care of variants as well, as long as you are getting the recommended dosing. And so I want to say in the setting of variants and people being worried, the best thing to do is to, is to get vaccinated. Very good, thank you. Um, you had a slide on this, on on kind of the uh, the process by which these vaccines were were researched and approved. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the emergency use authorization that is currently the approval from the FDA versus kind of the regular approval process? And and uh, you know, uh, I've been seeing kind of some some stories about hesitancy, hesitancy in the population being associated with the fact that this is quote unquote an emergency use authorization versus the the, the normal approval process. Um, and when would we expect to see the FDA kind of convert from a, an emergency use authorization to just a, a full uh, approval? Yeah, thank you very much. So, so um, these vaccines go through what's called either EUA emergency use authorization or what's called a full biologics license application. An emergency use authorization is really activated in times of um, crisis and times of pandemic. And that is where you basically, um, you, you know, you have a, um, um, a vaccine where there is absolutely nothing else available. Uh, there is no um, pre-existing available vaccine. What's very, very important to understand is that these, to get the emergency use authorization, they still need to go through the same rigorous clinical trials process. And really with the endpoint being that large phase three trial tested in 30,000 people demonstrating the clinical efficacy. That is really demonstrating the point. This vaccine prevents 
COVID-19 infection. Not that it produces antibodies or anything, it actually prevents people getting infected. And so, especially when you think about a pandemic and a virus spreading quickly, you're actually going to get those results very quickly. Whereas with some other infections, it could take a longer time. The other thing that was very important is that there was an absolute stipulation from the FDA, very certain that we need at least a minimum of two months of safety data for an emergency use authorization. Why two months? Because the vast, vast majority of serious side effects occur within four to six weeks. And so they were giving themselves a buffer to make sure that serious side effects within the six week period were captured. Now, when you think about emergency use authorization, it's important to think of it as a step to a full biologics application. So all of these companies and, and, and these the vaccine manufacturers, as they apply for an emergency use authorization, they will be applying for the full license. The full license will have a longer follow up data um, for six months, um, uh, a lot more paperwork involved in full license, full licensure. But I want to iterate that in terms of the benchmarks that they have to pass for safety and for how the trials are conducted, this is really still incredibly, incredibly rigorous. Thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, being a parent of young children. I, I have a, a son who is 11 years old and the, thus is part of the population that, that is not yet eligible uh, for uh, the, the COVID-19 vaccines. Can you speak a little bit about why, um, you know, why the cutoff is at 12 years old uh, right now? And when can we expect to see approval for vaccinations for those uh, 11 and under? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. So, you know, as you can imagine, um, you know, when you have children, it's they're different body sizes. They their immune systems sometimes react very vigorously to, to vaccines. And so a vaccine um, dose and how it's studied in adults isn't always going to be applicable to a child. And so you actually have to do separate trials. So we actually have the trial data from Pfizer, um, you know, showing the safety and effectiveness sort of down to 12 years. And what's happening is, you know, a lot of these companies are sort of now doing the, you know, clinical trials to check on dosing at those younger than 12. And those are, those are ongoing. Um, they they may want to have a slightly longer period of uh, follow-up for these children. So it might mean that they actually want a six-month period of follow-up. Um, and, and really, we're going to see them go down some of these uh, these trials sort of all the way down to, to infants as well. I'm really hopeful at this stage that, you know, sort of towards the end of the year, um, certainly by winter, we kind of have some data to move that, you know, lower than 12. I would really encourage as a family um, that whoever can get vaccinated, if you're above 12, you get vaccinated. That will actually help protect your younger ones who are unvaccinated. Um, and so, um, and, and for those who are unvaccinated, so our children is like, you know, a reliance of those other means of, of masking and distancing are very helpful too. Um, so for the, ma the main message I would say is, you know, I'm eager. I'm looking forward to the time when the vaccine's available so my children can get vaccinated. But for now, any member of your family that can get vaccinated, please do get vaccinated. Very good, thank you. Um, a couple of questions we had uh, just about logistics of, of getting the vaccine. Um, you know, where can you get the vaccine? Is there a cost associated with getting a vaccine? Uh, what's, the, what's the best way to go about that? Well, thankfully there's a lot of places to get from vaccine now. Again, this is one of the benefits six months down the line. So, you know, UT Southwestern is still a, uh, is still a public uh, site for vaccination. Um, many of the uh, pharmacies, um, um, uh, you know, offer vaccination. And, and so um, one of the things I would really encourage is, is don't, um, you know, wherever you can get the vaccine, get the vaccine. And if that's just a trip down the road to your pharmacist, uh, local pharmacy, that's the place to get it. Um, it's free. Uh, this is, uh, you know, that's been uh, federally mandated. There should be absolutely um, zero charge for COVID-19 vaccine. Um, you know, no insurance costs, no copay. This is this is free. Um, for So the access and the availability is is there. 
Um, so um, yeah, we are we are in a in much in terms of access and availability. It's, it's not the same scenario that was in December or or January. We have plenty of vaccine available. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Given the vaccination rates uh, that we've seen, what have you seen uh, in terms of the the demographics, especially of the hospitalized patients, the, the people experiencing serious symptoms now versus um, the start of the pandemic, when I think we saw many more kind of uh, elderly and and at risk uh, patients in the hospitals? Have we seen a shift in, in those demographics? Yeah, thank you for that question. So so. That data is sort of still being understood, but but the one thing is clear is that the vast vast majority, and we're sort of talking, you know, way over ninety percent of people with COVID nineteen who are getting infected are unvaccinated. And so, when we have a Delta variant that is, um, uh, you know, uh, more transmissible, unvaccinated persons are going to be at high risk of hospitalization. The second thing is that you know our strategy for vaccination and for sort of rolling out um, the the vaccination focused on higher risk individuals first, and so thankfully many of our elderly folk, um, you know, and those with comorbidities have been vaccinated. But you know, there is a larger population in, in the younger population where vaccine is still available and eligible to them. But there may be the perception that, well, I'm not going to get sick from this. I'm at sort of lower risk, and um, certainly there are cases of, of you know, those in the, between the ages, you know, of 18 to 40 being hospitalised. And, you know, I I really want to iterate that um, sometimes when we've been in a pandemic so long, and we see the stats and we sort of see things getting better, there's a tendency to sort of minimise and forget what how severe the past has been. And this is a serious infection. And even if there's just a mild case of COVID-19, we're now understanding that there are multiple subtle effects of that infection that can occur, um, you know, such as with long haul, that can actually have a profound impact on your ability to live everyday life. And so really the best way is to prevent this infection in, in the first place and, and not rest on, youth or or lack of comorbidities or you know uh, you know of, of how healthy you've been do we have data yet on on whether or not um vaccinated individuals who may experience a breakthrough uh infection are at less risk of long-haul syndrome or long-haul symptoms um so i think we're getting in terms of the long-haul specific outcome we're still sort of gathering data on, on how that manifests or not. I think what is really, really clear is that preventing infection in the first place is, is obviously going to be the, the, the sort of first, the, the sort of more proximal step. And so, um, you know, I, I think similarly, there have been the ongoing studies to sort of understand people who have long haul and get COVID-19 vaccines. There are some sort of sporadic reports of people feeling better after that. We're still understanding that. It's a difficult thing to study. Um, and so, you know, I, I really would say that um, preventing this in the first place is, is the best way. Um, kind of going back to the to the pediatric population. Um, so the, the American Association of Pediatrics uh, came out with a recommendation earlier this week that all uh, K through 12 students wear masks in school. Um, is there, are there other things that that you think would be helpful uh, in preventing the spread of COVID in that population? Are there other steps that we should be taking to uh, to protect those, especially those children that, that cannot be vaccinated at this point? Yeah, so as I mentioned, our you know under 12s represent a population that there is no you know vaccine authorized at present. Um, you know, I'm I'm you know we have to think very globally about our children's development and what it means to be at school, which is very very important. And so the recommendation is you know if you can't get vaccinated, then wear masks. This is a respiratory disease; it's spread you know via the respiratory route. The, the only other thing I would add is that 
um, you know, the other thing you can do to to protect your children and protect yourselves is for you yourself, if you're eligible to get vaccinated, is to get vaccinated. You know, the more in our community that we are vaccinated, the lower community spread that we're going to have, the lower, um, you know, our risk among our children. And, you know, um, I, you know, I, 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 I I want to sort of iterate something, you know, we often hear about vaccination being a personal choice. Um, it is a personal choice, but it actually has consequences for everyone. And so um, for our community and for our well-being, um, you know, understand that that step you take to vaccination is one step closer to normalcy. Um, it benefits your community, your friends, your family. It helps our schools. Um, if the baseline rate of COVID-19 is so low in our community, then our children are going to be safer too. Very good. Uh, I can think of uh, no better kind of conclusion. Uh, and um, I will I will reiterate it's, you know, it is a personal choice. Uh, but as our governor said yesterday, it is also a matter of personal responsibility. And so um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Aris Ratnam for being here, for sharing the information and his expertise with us today as a community. Um, and I would just like to leave uh, our Comet community um, with the thought that uh, I suspect that most of you uh, who have taken the time out of your day to listen into this presentation are probably already vaccinated. Um, but if you can take the time to talk with your family and friends um, I think there is a growing body of evidence that shows those personal relationships and encouragements are what are able to change minds uh, and convince people if they're reluctant or hesitant to get a vaccine, to get a vaccine. So if you haven't already, have those conversations. Ask people that you know, your friends and family, whether they're vaccinated. And if they're not, have a conversation with them about it, about it and, uh, and try to convince them that it's the right thing to do. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday at our town hall. Have a great afternoon. Campus is open and we can't wait to see you back here. As your student government president, I can't wait to see you back on campus this fall. And we are so excited for our student athletes to play in front of you, their fellow Comets again. The campus is ready, the laboratories are ready, and all we need is you. All we need is you. All we need is you. All we need is you.